All set. Well, welcome everyone to today's edition of the Regenerative Finance Aligned Voter Committee subcommittee meeting. Um, we have just a fantastic program today and I wanna get right to it. Um, welcome to everyone in the room. We are going to hear from da, 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 strategic finance today. And uh, all of you know that stability is the protocol, uh, sorry, is the scope in focus for this week. And I, you know, I can't think of another team that is more key to you know, so many aspects of that scope and have a long history with Maker. And so without further ado, I, I want to hand over the floor to Strategia Steakhouse. The chefs are all, well, the key chefs are here. And then we'll save some time at the end uh, for space to uh, do a little housekeeping and talk about what we got last week from our delegates. But um, uh, Adrian Ace, I'd love to hand you the floor. Thanks so much for being here. Awesome. Thanks, Ganga. Uh, this is Ace, also known as Mark. Uh, got a little presentation prepared for you all today and uh, excited to uh, talk a little bit about Steakhouse and kind of the work we're doing at Maker and uh, answer any questions that um, people may have. So let me give this screen share a shot. All right, let me know if you guys can see that. Okay, awesome. Just gonna skip through. We have a boring disclaimer that I won't bore you guys with, but I'll send in the chat for this to read. Uh, but high level, this is for your informational purposes only. Um, you know, please don't rely on this information for you know any investment, financial, legal, or other decisions. <clears throat> so. What is Stakehouse? Um, our mission is to support DeFi projects with financial reporting and analysis to assist in evaluating the financial health of their protocol. Uh, we want to provide stakeholders with the visibility and transparent information they need to help maximize the sustainability and proliferation of the project. You know, one of the big things that drew me to Maker in the first place was you know, this on-chain uh, triple entry accounting ledger system and to people without a finance or accounting background they may think that that's super boring but you know having um you know grown up and gone through university you know reading a lot of different sec filings um you know 10ks and 10qs to learn about investing um and learning about a ton of frauds over the years from you know enron to lehman brothers to all these various uh, Chinese companies that plagued the you know early 2010s. Um, I always felt that, that you can have audited financials, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the information is um, you know accurate. So, you know, when I saw Seb's first iterations of MakerDAO financial reports, there was using fully open source information on the blockchain as a finance nerd. I was like, this is super cool. You can actually go in and you know, validate the information on the blockchain. It's all public, open to everyone. Um, and, you know, one of the core missions for Stakehouse is to help build that for the entire ecosystem. And it was one of the key reasons that, you know, led to us deciding to kind of create the business in the first place. And to continue, like our vision is to provide the most accurate and clear financial reporting across the entire crypto industry. You know, leveraging that immutability and transparency of the public blockchain to provide financial reporting that exceeds the requirements of the uh, international financial reporting standards. So, um, you know, with the you know real time block by block updates, um, you know, we want to basically build out kind of real time financial statements, real time financial data, um, and you know, Dune's been a, an excellent tool for that. Uh, it still has some growing pains, but um, it's been really critical for us to, you know, build this on top of and try and make this vision a reality. Um, you know, with Stakehouse and MakerDAO, uh, we're mostly, you know, focused on traditional 
uh, FP and activities, as well as advising on real asset transaction, commercial and legal risk, and uh, asset liability management, which we'll go into some more detail on. So uh, recently, uh, we've been involved with um, the deployment of the Block Tower Project Andromeda Vault, which is Ladder Treasuries. Um, the risk and legal assessment of New Silver Vault um, was just posted this past week for the upsizing to the 50 million DC. Um, and a review of tokenized TBO products, you know, where we grow more and more excited about uh, the tokenization of traditional financial assets through you know, various jurisdictions, various products, various chains. And we look forward to having you know, a breadth of products to choose from for MakerDAO and other you know, projects in the ecosystem to take advantage of. You know, certainly make our lives a lot easier um, compared to trying to track stuff on chain, which you know, has much more risks and rooms for, room for error compared to you know, the on-chain world. On the uh, ALM side, as you know, Alcare subdials are launched and capital is diversified from Maker Core, um, you know, we believe liquidity management will become even more important for Maker to maintain a stable peg. And you know, we have a deep belief that automating these activities uh, will be critical. Um, we really want to push for the autonomous uh, A word in the you know DAO acronym. And we feel that, you know, there's going to be ample opportunity to do this in the future. And we'll go into a little more detail as well. Um, on the reporting side, you know, the complexity of Maker and the ecosystem DeFi continues to increase. And we're reinvesting in reporting capabilities to help empower the sub future subdao community members with the information they need um, to help govern the allocator DAOs and other subdaos in the future. So RWAs, slowly and suddenly. Um, it's crazy, like, working in uh, RWAs, working with RWAs. You know, if you think about uh, RWAs at a high level, it feels like things move pretty slowly on the, on the inside. And then if you zoom out, you can kind of see how much progress has been made over the past couple of years. We had the first, uh, you know, drawing of die against RWA collateral. And, April 2021, and you know, a little over two years later, we're approaching three billion in RWA's outstanding backing uh, die, which is pretty incredible. Um, you know, obviously the uh, short end, short interest rate, uh, or short end of the treasury bill curve, um, you know, being as high as, as is helped uh, you know increase that uh, trajectory. But nonetheless, it's you know it's quite exciting to see how much progress has been made in such a short period of time. Um, you know, Maker is yeah, very close to three billion uh, in die backing, uh, or three billion RWA collateral backing die, um, and should get quite close to that as Andromeda moves to full deployment. Um, today, over seventy percent of the protocol's stability fees are generated by RWA collateral, and that'll probably inch up towards you know eighty plus um, once these final RWA deals, um, the final short ones, are are uh, you know. Uh, fully allocated to. And with the allocator subdials on the horizon, there's many interested, you know, counterparties, you know, from technology companies to asset originators that are looking to you know, partner with MakerDAO and in the future subdows. And we were just at ETCC last week and there's a tremendous amount of buzz around RWAs. And, um, you know, it's certainly nice to see them carry a token, uh, you know, pump a little bit. Um, you know, perhaps that's a beneficiary of, you know, some of the buzz, buzz from ECC, but who knows. And on the ALM side, is automation possible? Um, you know, we believe that it's absolutely essential for the allocator subdown model to be successful uh, as defined by Maker Core um, to, to automate this process. Um, you know, all the credit is due to Hexnot for uh, putting this this drawing together, but essentially this was from a post that he had made in in December, and something we've been actively talking to him about is how do we kind of automate the flows of liquidity to ensure that um, we maintain a stable peg and that we also kind of optimize for uh, stability fees for the protocol, and you know 
what we've kind of concluded is it's much better to have a algorithmic quantitative model uh, you know, dynamically setting the debt ceilings uh, for the various uh, liquidity buckets than having static, you know, kind of fixed, slowly changing uh, debt ceilings for these different liquidity buckets. And um, with the move to the sub DAOs and as things kind of fragment out and get more complex, you know, it's going to be more and more important for us to kind of come up with an automated solution, especially if the DAO wants to make many sub DAOs and allocate more capital, it's going to be harder and harder to keep track of everything. So the extent that we can kind of set rules at the maker core level and uh, let these, um, you know, ALM controllers uh, kind of automate the liquidity, uh, it, it shouldn't result in a much more um, stable uh, peg. Um, so, yeah, the idea is basically, you know, come up with an ideal collateral mix and, you know, we see the first iterations of that in the stability scope and then continue your balance, uh, these buckets to protect the peg and optimize for stability fees. Um, all right. Now I'll, uh, pass it over to, uh, ADCV to talk about some of the more exciting things that, uh, we're doing at Steakhouse. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. It's been a while since these governance and risk meetings. Um, yeah, happy to, uh, to talk about the stuff that we're passionate about, which is crypto accounting, incredibly. Um, to give an overview of how we're thinking about crypto accounting, I think this, um, I think this uh, perspective of the ecosystem is how we sort of see our role, where you have a sort of decentralized security layer built on the layer one. And on top of that, you build decentralized value protocols, such as MakerDAO. And these decentralized value protocols allow all sorts of market participants to interact with each other and transact free. But our view is that in order to give them the confidence that they can do this safely, uh, we can propose a way of doing crypto accounting that gives an overview of the illustrative economics of a value protocol at the at the sort of protocol layer. The advantage of uh, so the advantage of public blockchains is that you can essentially anyone can essentially in theory produce their own financial statements. The curse of the abundance of data is that it's very difficult, and there are multiple ways of doing it. So all we're doing is proposing one way that you could hypothetically look at a protocol like MakerDAO in a particular way, such that it might be useful for somebody who was deciding to, you know, pick between one stable coin at, out of various possibilities. On the next slide, and if you can switch slides, Mark. What this means in practice is that we take a technical contract diagram, such as the one on the left, and characterize it in a diagram that kind of looks like the shapes on the right. So Maker, just to underline, Maker is not a bank. However, we believe that it can be usefully characterized with similar balance sheet structures as a bank in order to provide people the insight into the risks and benefits of trusting a protocol. There's utility to this framing because many people understand this concept of assets, liabilities, and equity. And so organizing information in this way provides a baseline for comparison with other systems. Um, yeah, you can call it whatever you want, but uh, I think once you look, in, look at things through the lens of sort of assets, liabilities, and equity and as, as sort of balance sheets interacting with each other, you can't unsee it. Um, on the next slide, if you zoom out, you can see that this conception lets you make interesting maps of the relationships between value exchange protocols that puts sort of the whole system into perspective. So this diagram by our stakeholders colleagues and ventures is inspired by research done by Zoltan Boscia on the shadow banking system. And it maps conceptual balance sheets of so-called protocols across various different types of intermediaries, but with a crypto lens. So, you know, once you look at the world through this lens, you can begin to understand the potential power of bringing together all of these participants, but on the same phone line, so to speak. 
So in a TradFi context or in a shadow banking context, which is how Bosch developed this, this diagram in the first place, all of this value is segregated into protectionist little silos that closely track, for example, country or geopolitical borders. And, you know, with with all the opacity of, of, of TradFi to boot, it's much harder to get a, say, like a Thai bank and a Chilean bank to agree on whether a wire is cleared than it is to get someone to mint state teeth and collateralize it in Maker for Dai, for example. Uh, yeah, sure. Like we, we actually have both uh, references in the sources, but I realized that I'm just going to see if this works. Here. Yeah. So on the next slide, we show what this means for Maker specifically. And okay, let me send. So you can access this on the forums website. It's and this is the link to the Power BI view. We have a gene query where we've categorized a long list of individual transactions all the way to the start of the protocol. And these transactions can be collated into a sum across time to produce a balance sheet and it's sum within periods for statements of change. In this view that we're showing, uh, we're showing the balance sheet for MakerDAO since the very beginning. You can track the evolution of its liabilities, both inside and outside the DSR, as well as the composition and allocation to various uh, collateral types. But crucially, you can drill down into each value in this Power BI view and surface every single individual transaction hash that we've used to produce it. So on the next slide. So there is also a reference here. I'm going to be posting these into the chat. We start with the decoded smart contracts from June, from which we pull up the output and we classify according to a chart of accounts. And this is where we act with a little bit of discretion. So we're the ones who are just deciding that this is how we're going to call the chart of accounts. And that's what we're calling, you know, maker gap. Um, but I think the advantage of doing this open source is that you can essentially check our work. And this is one of the reasons that we like working in June Analytics so much. Uh, the fact that it's open source and it's open data means that we can basically show our work in, in public view. In this particular example, we're coding the DAI savings rate into our chart of accounts. So the DAI savings rate in this instance records new DAI balances in the VAT and allocates them to the pot contract as it accrues. So you know, technically the accrual only occurs sort of block by block, but it's reflected in catch-up transactions whenever people interact with either contract. In practice, this occurs often enough so that there are no perceptible discontinuities in the value series. So there may be, if you know, people stopped using MakerDAO completely, then you may you may expect to see some some strange results. And so we code two things: a decrease in equity through an interest expense account and the balance sheet must balance. So because we're not adding any, adding or removing any assets, the change must be coming from the liabilities. And so logically, if you issue one die to the pot, then the equity must reduce by one and the liabilities or die outstanding must increase by one. So the balance sheet ends up balancing. This is a very useful way of, and this is how we sort of categorize each individual transaction hash. You can see that we have the call TX hash, uh, parameter that we're saving into the database. And then for the Power BI view, we basically s sort of troll and update a Snowflake database every sort of every so often so that we don't explode our June API builds. And then we uh, show it through a, a Power BI view that, that's accessible. On the next slide. The interesting thing about uh, crypto protocols is that the sovereign home jurisdiction of decentralized protocols is Ethereum rather than any given country, which means that the choice of presentation token is a little bit arbitrary because it doesn't actually matter. So it makes sense to present a protocol in its own liability token. So in the case of Lido, it would be Stake Teeth, for example, in the case of MakerDAO, it would be DAI. But there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to just translate these token values at their historical exchange rates to literally any other token, whether it's you know ETH, government tokens, commodities, whatever you want. Fundamentally, the income statement here shows the impact of all operating expenses, including governance token denominated. Oh God. Yeah, including governance token uh, denominated ones. 
And then if you work out the changes in the equity, so to speak, from issuing or using to pay expenses new tokens or, or burning them or doing buybacks, you can reconcile the protocol surplus in one period to another. And in our Power BI view, we have a little toggle switch that lets you switch from DAI to ETH uh, back and forth. And, and you can see this effect. And then in the next slide, uh, yeah, we'll send the reference for this as well. All of this data uh, lets us organize the information in really useful ways, including A4 financial reports, which is weird to think that people may print this. Um, and, you know, we've added our own sort of quote unquote management discussion and risk disclosures, and you can print them if you want. Um, and then on the next page, Yeah, the reason, so the reason that we think this is really powerful is uh, that we believe that triple entry accounting is the gold standard for financial reporting and transparency. So, you know, Enron had hundreds of millions of dollars in off-balance sheet vehicles that nobody knew about. If you looked at Credit Suisse's balance sheet a few days before it imploded, you would have seen that it had a very healthy 15% tier one capital ratio, but there's no way for anyone to independently verify it. For as long as we've sort of trusted the, the the trust function to sort of auditors and implicitly to regulators, the problem with this is that it has zero margin for error, as you trust humans who have non-zero error rates. And so with the approach that we have for crypto accounting in Maker, we're trying to take the view that you know transaction hashes are the ultimate source of truth. Now, uh, yeah, we have a few sort of concluding slides, but these are less relevant. There are a few sort of working progresses here that are worth mentioning. The first is that all of these transactions, so we take the view, the conservative view, that everything that's, that's the, that the accounting reality is everything that is reflected on chain. Obviously, Maker has gone to, through a substantial transformation, and a lot, a substantial part of its assets are now proving off chain. We see this as a transitional period where we need to sort of push forward with some of these legal structures and to get the ball moving in, in an off-chain context. But it's clear that the gold standard is, is uh, to move everything to legally compliant and legally secure structures that are fully available on-chain so that all of these calculations can, can actually be done for real-world collateral also which is not the case necessarily today. Um, yeah, and that's it. We have a few more memes. Um, this is quoting from Amin Soleimani, one of the creators of the Rise stablecoin, uh, you know, to illustrate the idea that we're building this with the, we're building this with the idea of, of promoting self-regulation through maximum neutrality and transparency as a key value. Um, this actually comes from one of his tweets. Quite a funny, smart guy. Um, I've sort of run out of steam here. Uh, maybe we can open the floor to the to the delegates to, to sort of ask questions and. Thank you both. It's uh, yeah, terrific to hear from you. We miss you miss the presentations on the old governance and risks call. Uh, anyone's welcome to come off of mute and verbally ask a question. We'd love that, or type in the chat. You guys know I always have words. <laughs> I guess I'll, uh, I'll start with the chat. Okay. Um, do you see room for expansion into RWAs beyond U.S. Treasuries? Uh, I think we do. Uh, and um, I know there's a lot of work being done on the scopes right now um, to kind of try and define you know, what uh, assets Maker will be open to in the future. And it's, I think, a, a challenging problem because... Uh, of the ever-changing interest rate environment and macroeconomic environments. Um, so, you know, one asset may generally make more sense 
um, in, a, in, a, in a specific uh, interest rate environment, and then you know, desires may change depending on um, you know a, a separate one. But long story short, um, you know we got into crypto because we saw a better system, or at least the potential for a better system, and you know we're excited to help you know the future sub DAOs and allocator DAOs like do deals that not only have a positive social impact on the real world, but really take advantage of the intrinsic qualities of the blockchain. We want to leverage this technology uh, to you know, reduce costs and overhead and all these different middlemen and the TradFi ecosystem that you know, take their toll fee along the way and also build something that's much more transparent. You know, it's, it's extremely frustrating going through this bear market with um, you know, all these CFI lenders blowing up and people saying, oh, crypto is blowing up again. Uh, but the reality is none of these lenders were doing on-chain lending. You know, I kept telling people, I was like, uh, MakerDAO didn't have any bad debt. Uh, the same companies that were lending and going belly, belly up had to, you know, repay their loans with Maker. Um, so, um, you know, we want to help build something that helps educate people too. So, um, sorry, I went off a little bit of a tangent, but yes, uh, we do see room for expansion beyond TS Treasuries. <laughs> So we got a question. Yeah. Sorry, did you want to take it, Mark? Uh, I was just, I haven't even read it yet, but if you want to take this one or I can t read it and take it. So shadow banking systems are known for their inter interconnectedness with the traditional banking system. How does our accounting system consider the potential impact of events in the traditional financial system and the DeFi ecosystem? I think the, so at the moment, the biggest uh, let's say blind spot in our accounting system is everything that's accrued off chain. This is this is clearly a blind spot. We disclaim it accordingly. Uh, we can we take the conservative view that on chain only counts, and I think this is a reasonable view. You could think, you know, Maker Burn, for example, shows estimates. I think we also show, like in our annual reports, we have a page, we have pages at the back where we show like the accrued off chain interest revenues. And I think those perspectives are useful and necessary. We obviously do all of this reporting with the real asset reports and so forth. But I think the idea of keeping everything on chain is a way to set a sort of forcing function to push as much as possible on chain. And I think, you know, there are pros and cons of that. that I think that state, a state where 100% of the assets of make that bank maker are tokenized in a sort of robust way is better than having things that are off chain. But you are still exposed to sort of, you know, impacts from the real world. And I think the clearest example was during the USDC uh, DPEG uh, uh, Lollapalooza shit show in March, um, where, you know, you saw uh, knock on effects from exposure to the traditional banking system propagate through DeFi through this tokenized vehicle, which was set up in a way that, that allowed this sort of market. Um, let's say devaluation of the circle that you were to, to, to exist. I will say that, you know, relative to, you know, we take, you know, people criticize us to see the DPEG and all this. To an extent, I think it is, even that is an improvement on TradFi, where if you compare USDC, you are getting real-time market updates on the value or the market perception of what the value of a USDC deposit was in sort of real time. While with SVB, the same thing was taking place, but with no ability to reflect that real-time value to anyone. So all you could really do is sort of wait and see. So yeah, even in a sort of real-time case of you know a real-world asset propagating to on-chain entities through USDC, it's, it was bad, but it was still better than to sort of sit on your hands and wait for the weekend to finish. And I think that we can move the, the more the market sort of progresses in in this sort of tokenized area, you know, the more we'll see jurisdictions that have you know robust setups with bankruptcy protection for token holders or you know even permissionless ones. Like I think these this evolution will take place, but what we're doing now is we're sort of living a little bit on the frontier and we're pushing things forward. Uh, in order to catalyze this this change, which won't come without, uh, you know, unprompted. 
Sorry, I'll run through again. All right. Uh, question from, yeah, and just completely agree with your uh, common FE. Um, hopefully one day it'll be sufficient education so uh, the media and mass populace understand, but yeah, one day. Uh, question from True Name. Do you have reflections on the old core unit model and new structured advisors, ecosystem actors, and facilitators? Do you have views on the role aligned delegates should play in supporting the ecosystem improvements versus what professional advisory council appointees would do? Um, that is a good question. I think I, you know, personally, and I think the views will vary amongst the team, have a little bit of a soft spot for the you know, core unit model, just because when I first was introduced to Maker, you know, that was something that, you know, Maker was pushing forward and really, you know, the only doubt that I could see that was, you know, going through this decentralization and, uh, you know, something that was unique and challenging and exciting. It's like, not only on one hand, are you trying to build a DeFi protocol, um, you know, uh, on-chain collateral back stablecoin, but you're also trying to create a new model for, um, you know, uh, professional and like human, like interaction and engagement in an organization. And that's, uh, you know, both of those together are extremely challenging. Um, you know, even by themselves are extremely challenging. Um, uh, I think this new model is uh, quite interesting and exciting. I think the, you know, some things that resonated with me, resonated with me personally on it, where you're trying to push innovation out on the edges and, you know, help uh, keep the stability of maker core intact and, you know, take some bets with, you know, the creator sub DAOs and allocator sub DAOs and that can kind of specialize and have a little more autonomy over, um, you know, their subsection of like the ecosystem. Um, so I think that's pretty exciting and, you know, looking forward to see how things uh, progress under that model. Um, you know, with, as it relates to the, you know, line delegates and um, professional advisory council appointees, um, I'm definitely uh, interested to see um, much more uh, participation in the eco ecosystem, like through these appointees. And I think there's a lot of room for, you know, new people to come out to the ecosystem and also room for, you know, existing contributors to, you know, join these uh, councils and, and uh, delegate positions um, and really like leave their mark on, you know, very you know, innovative and um, compelling protocol. Um, you know, specifically, I try and, uh, you know, kind of focus within our niche of, you know, finance and RWAs. Um, and leave the, the governance stuff to the experts. But um, I don't know if you have any comments, Adrian. Yeah, same. I mean, yeah, um, I'm quite uh, low IQ, so I really understand this uh, stable coins. I have difficulty parsing, you know, governance. I handle politics very badly. I think uh, the advantage of a system that focuses yeah, it definitely feels more focused than under the old core unit model. You know, people are pointing in a similar direction and each one is in their lane and sort of executing against a, a very clear mandate. I think this is an advantage of having governance with very explicit rules. And we see this across, you know, some of the other DAOs that we contribute to, where governance rules are maybe less clear or implicit and sort of up in the air. Um, and that actually makes things a lot harder when rules are very, very minutely explicit and clear. There's no room for discussions, or there, let's say, less room for discussions in politics. It's like this is the rule. This is how the, uh, the system operates. This is what you do. It's like clear. So for someone with a very limited amount of intellectual uh, brain power, this is a, a blessing. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, question from Xerox Defense here. With the current RWA allocation in mind, what would you like to shed light on or see change before mass adoption slash scaling, if anything? Also, are there any changes needed uh, of the stability scope from your point of view? Um, I think with the current RWA allocation, it's you know obviously, I think, quite conservative. We're scaling into short duration treasuries and you know really there's not... Uh, a ton um, of financial incentive to not do that, given how high the short end of the yield curve is. Um, 
I think generally, you know, looking at the you know, legacy and other vaults and kind of as we look to do um, some other types of RWA deals as a DAO, assuming that the DAO wants to do that, you know, I think, you know, continuing to reinvest in transparency and sharing more with the DAO so we can get, you know, more points of view and more feedback and just more, um, you know, uh, eyes on everything that it is RWAs. Um, you know, we want to, um, you know, ideally have all these sorts of assets tokenized in the future and then, um, you know, have all of that on chain. Uh, it's, we're in this kind of like interim period where, you know, we're tokenizing some stuff and then doing some other, you know, purely off chain deals and, you know, trying to mix and marry the two, um, in the financial reporting and accounting. And it's a temporary headache that I think will be alleviated. You know, Seb um, and the team wrote up a, a big report over, you know, tokenized T-bills. There's all these new products coming to market with various trade-offs and um, legal considerations, but it's something that, you know, we're really excited about. Um, and ex- hopefully we can, you know, start to do some more, you know, pure on-chain stuff uh, in the future, or I guess pure as it can be as it relates to um, RWAs. Um, in regards to like the part about the changes for the stability scope, um, that's a good question. I think, uh, you know, personally, um, we're gonna have to do some trial and error and a lot of, you know, back testing of models to kind of figure out, um, the trade-offs between liquidity and uh, stability fee income for the protocol. And then the DAO and the token holders are going to have to decide, you know, what they're comfortable with. You know, of course, you can maximize stability by having, you know, purely um, you know, stable coins in the PSM back and die, or you can start putting stuff into, you know, treasuries and, you know, even slightly higher risk AAA um, uh, types of credit. But it really comes down to, you know, what the DAO is comfortable with and where they want to, you know, uh, have the trade off um, in favor of. Um, question from Navigator. You mentioned there are new entities companies want to work with Maker on RWA. Is there anything more you can say about this? Will this demand help drive better deals, more competitive yield? Um, I do think that uh, this will drive better deals and more com- competitive yield for sure. Um, you know, RWAs wasn't a thing um, three years ago, right? And a lot of these early deals were kind of you know proof of concept and kind of you know trying to make trying to do something. Um, uh, and start start the process of this like innovation cycle, and you know we're seeing we're getting more and more startups that reach out to you know Steakhouse and you know, ask us to share what we can about RWAs, just like in general like views on the industry, um, kind of the dynamics, and you know we're we're getting a lot of people that you know just reach out, want to learn, and uh, have different deals in various jurisdictions and. Um, that, uh, you know, increase in, you know, startup activity and demand, I think will just result in more options for, um, for the DAO and the token holders to kind of assess, you know, what they want to do. Um, so, um, you know, obviously, uh, when we did like earlier deals as a DAO, uh, there was, you know, not as much competition, not as many people that were, you know, wanting to work with the DAO given all the challenges, um, uh, that they're facing both on the technical side, but also, you know, the legal side and everything that comes with it. Um, but yeah, things are definitely getting better. Uh, question from Cloaky. What are your thoughts on the stablecoin proposals from Paxos and Gemini? I'm interested in hearing your perspective on these proposals and how you believe they might impact peg stability. Um, I think they're uh, great proposals in general. Um, you know, uh, having a PSM that also contributes income and helps um, you know keep the peg stable is is quite optimal. Obviously, you're not earning the return that you would if you put that money into treasuries. But from what I've seen, looking at the on-chain data and the activity um, that's going in and out of the PSMs, um, you know, Paxos and Gemini are, are quite effective at keeping the peg, um, and we're even used as arbitrage mechanisms um, over USDC, even when there was, you know, billions of USDC in the PSM. Um, I think like the longer that they're around, the more 
market makers and um, you know participants in the ecosystem are KYC'd and um, you know familiar using them, um, and uh, that just leads to more and more participants able to do the ARB if there is an ARB and move in and out of the PSMs. Um, so, you know, ideally, you know, in the future, we have uh, an asset that's nearly as liquid, like a, like a you know, tokenized treasury that can go into the PSM and be swapped out very quickly for a stable coin. Because, um, you know, obviously we want assets that are as liquid as possible, but we want them to uh, generate a stability fee for, for the protocol as well. So, um, yeah, we're, we're fans of those, those deals. <laughs> Okay, well, if the questions are winding down, Kianga, what do you think, friend? Yes, um, I think we could use the rest of the time. This has been really great. Thanks for all the questions, everyone. Um, but maybe we can use the last few minutes to go through uh, what you have, Caroline. Sure. Sure. Okay. And we definitely have related questions. So if our guests have time to stay, maybe they could uh, chime in. That would be amazing. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. So let me share my screen. Okay. Let me know if you can see that. All right, I guess we don't have any housekeeping. Let's go into the stability scope advisories from our aligned delegates. Uh, the floor is bringing up a very important open question about the Harbor Trade Credit. What the heck happened? How can it be prevented thus far? Uh, there haven't really been any substantive um, responses to these questions. And Sensor is looking at a scope amendment at the necessity of a scope amendment to address this huge open question. Loki is calling out the ALM strategy, um, pointing out that in the stability scope, we do have an advisory council project budget, approximately 83,000 DAI max monthly amount for ALM related expenses. And Cloakey says that the current ALM strategy lacks solid foundation. Navigator is bringing up a really important uh, concern. I had not personally thought about it, but after reading the advisory, it made a lot of sense to me. Navigator is asking, to what extent does Maker need or should be working towards further stability advisory council members, given the current role of BA Labs? There might be advantages in getting other experts on board with the advisory council. So a chief value of the refi AVC is really cultivating when we say maximal inclusiveness and being very welcoming of outsider perspectives. This really just goes to the importance of cognitive diversity for collective intelligence. Uh, if we're a largely homogenous group, um, then we're going to have things like functional biases and collective biases that are quite um, invisible to us because there's no one that stands outside of our vantage point that can check and balance this sort of narrow, the narrow scope that we have on things. So I think Navigator's question is super important there. Uh, digging in a little bit into BA Lab's role, we see in the Ecosystem Actor official intro that there are three divisions in the company and that the analyst division is uh, right now the responsible facilitator of the stability scope as well as a member of the advisory council and forthcoming changes will entail switching out having a new responsible facilitator but retaining BA Labs as part of the Stability Scope Advisory Council. So just some questions that I was riffing on. Um, I'm curious to see what others think of this. Uh, it's, a, it's an open question. It's an interesting question. Um, can a scope facilitator monitor risks of its own misalignment? Uh, facilitator DAOs are always having responsibility after all for governance scope and uh, monitoring for alignment. Uh, and then there is this prohibition 
against an entity being operationally active in more than one alignment conserver role. And I know that an advisory council member is not technically an alignment conserver role, uh, but they are quite instrumental uh, in enacting alignment, making proposals uh, and ideas for actually uh, specific scope language, um, which has everything to do with alignment. So there is definitely a gray area, uh, and I can see, I, I, I can, I'm sort of drawing out more nuances from what, um, uh, from what Navigator mentioned, but I'm not saying that these are concerns that Navigator had. These are things that I was just riffing on myself. And then here is a question that Navigator actually put in the advisory. What happens if we do have two stability scope advisory council members, BA Labs and another entity, and there's conflicting advice between the two of them? That's that's very interesting, but I think that's also quite valuable uh, if we're taking the long-term view of collective intelligence. Uh, so thanks to Navigator for that. Bono Publica is pointing out the enhanced die savings rate. I think these are very, very crucial questions. Uh, I'm wondering if our guests may have any insight into this. Uh, monitoring and tracking. How do we plan to monitor and track the impact of the EDSR on DSR utilization, user growth, user retention, who is responsible? Uh, how often will the data be reviewed and reported? And are there any specific milestones or benchmarks that we should aim for in terms of these metrics? Great, great questions. Um, True Name has a very, very, very important point pointing out here with regards to new silver restructuring, um, proposing some sort of defined minimum timeline between the posting of risk and legal assessments and then the polling. Uh, this was a massive assessment and proposal on the forum, and True Name is commenting that uh, we would like to have a number of weeks to review and digest this, uh, and then posed a very important further question based on this following proposed language in MIP 102, can the ecosystem facilitator comment if they support maintaining and expanding this relationship? And this excerpt was specifically that in some cases, existing legal recourse assets can be maintained and even onboarded to preserve business relationships and reputation as determined by the facilitators uh, to which SES then replied, we believe this is a matter best left to the voters. So that is an open question, interesting interaction in response to True Name's prompt uh, that the facilitator kind of threw this back to the voters. Um, and then I think True Name had a very, very uh, pertinent comment on risk management. And again, Steakhouse, uh, our guests would love it if you could come off mute and share if you're still on the call. Uh, True Name is asking, has any ecosystem actor reviewed the financials of New Silver, et cetera, et cetera? Who on behalf of MakerDAO is taking responsibility to vet the service providers? Uh, Maker does not currently have an appropriate entity or independent team to perform the monitoring and compliance checks. It seems Steakhouse just reports the facts, but we think something more rigorous, proactive, and potentially adversarial is required for the overall sustained health and risk management of the system. I'll pause here and see and see if anyone would like to come off mute or say something in response to that. Her name is saying in the text, the scope language says something different than the ecosystem's response. Uh, yeah, so actually I think it's quite interesting because there are some misconception and I don't know what is uh, true or not. So as a ecosystem Sorry, actor, we are- oh. uh, That last part, there's a little background noise. I'm sorry, would someone have a question? Was Seb speaking? Yeah, I can take it. So we are reporting. Uh, sorry, I was just asking if uh, you could repeat the, the comments. Uh, There's some background noise. It wasn't, I couldn't clearly hear. I am hearing Seb. Is anyone else hearing Seb? Yes. One, two. Yes, I can hear you, Seb. So the comments, uh, let, Seb, let me just uh, quickly repeat the comment and then you jump sure. in, my friend, and you respond. Um, so this is True Name commenting on risk management. And he says that who on behalf of MakerDAO is taking responsibility to vet the service providers contracted in the RWA structures? Maker does not currently have an appropriate entity or independent team to perform monitoring and compliance checks across legacy LRAs. 
It seems the steakhouse just reports the facts, but we think something more rigorous, proactive, and potentially adversarial is required for the overall sustained health and risk management of the system. So, yeah, so I think the RIP's answer will be quite nuanced. So steakhouse try to be adversarial as much as possible and report and go in uh, depth. If you look at the preview, at the well, uh, real world asset report, anyone, you will see, for instance, for the centrifuge one, there is a small box in the image that there was in, in the document where last time there was a due diligence on both centrifuge and new silver. Uh, and uh, yeah, new silver if it's uh, new silver. So we assessed the financial of new silver once a year. That was uh, what we did uh, when we onboarded the deal and they were still uh, doing it. Now to the question, uh, who take responsibility? And let's be clear as well. We are just best effort. We have no contract and we take no responsibility on behalf of Megadow. That would be completely crazy to do it anyway, because we have no contractual relationship. More clear. So I don't think you can find anyone else to do it, neither. That's not something that could happen easily in, uh, in DeFi, I would say. And uh, anyway, the DAO doesn't exist, so it cannot sue injustice. So, in the court, sorry. So, what would be the point? So, but also, also, it's obviously a bit more complex than that because there are also a lot of uh, things happening. So, we try to do our best. And we can, you can assume that, well, if the world was ideal, we could do better. But the world is what it is. So, we try to do our best. We give the most information and if you look, uh, most of it is on the info in the, on the documents. Uh, now we don't have a link to the financial assessments. That's non and community can say, well, we don't invest if it's not public anyway, uh, for sure. So we try to be as public as possible up to the point that we cannot. And clearly we want to be uh, beyond what is uh, currently public, but that's it. Thank you, Seb. Thank you for that response. True name is uh, still typing. I will move on for now. We're running short on time. So now let's get into ecosystem intelligence reports. Uh, very quick one, super interesting, AVC's role in the ecosystem. Uh, following last week's meeting, we had such uh, intriguing ecosystem intelligence reports and suggested action items from our line delegates that we came to the question of, well, what exactly can AVCs do justifiably within the constraints of the Atlas and the limitations on our, on our uh, sort of powers? Uh, Patrick, uh, for those who did not see that interaction in Gov Alpha Public, I recommend that you go look at it. I essentially just took the uh, suggested action items and posed them as hypotheticals to Patrick. What do you think about AVCs actively liaison, actively doing outreach to, for instance, the CELA blockchain system? And Patrick said, um, this active liaison role seems fine to me based on the rules as currently written. You can make a cogent argument that this would fall within many of the items listed in the bullet points. I think the next uh, really key thing to do is to clarify that um, we need to have some sort of code of conduct in place. Uh, so this is just an initial step of, of many that, that needs to be done. Um, we need to have some sort of code of conduct, other protocols to ensure transparency, objectivity, and alignment mandates are maintained uh, in uh, AVCs interacting with uh, potential and current ecosystem actors. But I think this is a very, very interesting development. Defensor is pointing out that Ripple wins and a very interesting action item, tokenomics related to NuGov is not available in the US and to VPN users. It has been decided to not approach this market and we respect the choice. However, given developments, it might be relevant to monitor the developments in US regulation to be able to assess any relevant changes. Floki brings up an interesting item of intelligence, the Financial Innovation and Technology for the 21st Century Act. 
U.S. lawmakers put forth a bill encompassing various aspects of digital asset regulation. This particular bill, says Cloakey, appears to be more favorable in numerous ways compared to previous proposals. And as for the importance for refi AVC, this bill has several favorable aspects. It recognizes that payment stable coins should not be classified as securities. It grants the SEC the authority to oversee the utilization of payment stable coins on SEC registered platforms while refraining from exerting control over their design, structure, or operation. Although the passage of this bill is unlikely, it does offer a glimmer of hope amidst the prevailing uncertainty within the regulatory landscape. Thank you, Cloakey, for sharing that. And then we have a really, really cool item of intelligence from Navigator Lens version 2. TLDR Lens is a decentralized social graph launched by leaders of the Aave community. They just announced a major upgrade. Lens v2 makes it easy to add Web3 actions to any application, whether a Web3 native experience or a consumer facing experience. Increased value sharing opportunities between users, algorithms, curators, and apps. It's a programmable monetization layer. And so the intriguing question here, what does Maker have to do with any of this? Well, we offer the money part among other functions and features. There's a world of possibilities in terms of what a successful viral protocol like Lens could mean for DAI and for the rest of the Maker ecosystem. The Refi AVC is strongly invested in the development of stronger decentralized communities and ecosystems. Big picture question, consider what the advent of new functionality and new social infrastructure like Lens might mean for the future of regenerative finance, decentralized governance, and community building. So we have some really cool action items here. Uh, and I have, um, I'm have i in the process of reaching out to some contacts on the Lens team to try to get them on board. But this is super exciting. Thank you, thank you, thank you to Navigator. Uh, we have a 500 billion corporate debt storm gathering threatening skies. Strategic importance to refi AVC, says Bona Publica. Um, this insight can aid us in emphasizing the promotion of sustainable and responsible businesses. Yes, yes, yes. The article also signals potential socioeconomic consequences such as unemployment, reduced consumer spending, possibly necessitating strategic responses from AVCs to maintain community resilience in face of these challenges. I just really appreciate um, you pointing to this out, Bona Publica. Uh, I think it's very, very, very thoughtful and a very sort of pregnant statement to make in these times. So thank you for doing that. Uh, True Name is pointing out an incredible meeting, powerhouse with Sovereign Finance meeting. We have some TLDR to share with you. Very interesting discussion around various products in production that address many of ABC questions and concerns including tools for anonymous contributors and a privacy respecting reputation system, super exciting, financial transparency, tooling for documenting all ecosystem wide roadmaps of work being done by the various teams. And we have some really interesting action items to consider for our line scope proposals. What are some needs for advisory councils in regards to the AI work? Have a look-see at this when I post the uh, slides to the forum later. And then finally, we just have a really cool blog article. I think actually it was a Substack. Maker, burn, baby, burn. Very interesting investment thesis. It's a short read. Recommend that you get into that. Um, so that is the weekly highlights of the Stability Scope Advisories and the Ecosystem Intelligence Reports, my friends. Thank you, thank you, thank you once again for the excellent work from our line delegates. And I'll pause here if we have any final questions or comments. Going once, going twice. All right, well, well thank you Steakhouse, Adrian, Mark, Seb for joining us. This was like really great. Um, so much important information and, and we don't often get to hear your perspectives. Um, on these calls anymore. So appreciate your time and delegates for your great comments and questions and and the reports. Um, fantastic. We were really getting a lot from that and hopefully that's trickling throughout the community as more and more people, you know, realize that our delegates are, are putting those um, reflections together and that that's all open and available. So I think that that's all for today, all for this week. And we'll see you all next week.